So unfortunately for us, our brains aren't designed to memorize things on paper. So things like this, we have to use these tools because it's not how our brains are built. Like we did not evolve learning things on a 2D plane. Uh, we evolved in 3D space. So that means that thinking eidetically or thinking in three-dimensional space is going to help us quite a bit. So uh, Marissa, I'm gonna use you for this one. So I want you to try to memorize this number and I'm only gonna give you five seconds. This is gonna be very difficult. You ready? Go. Yes. What do you remember from that number? Uh, zero, one, four, seven, eight, five. That's as far as I got. Okay, and that's not bad. That's over one number per second, and you got it absolutely correct in order. Now I want you to hold up your hand like you're holding an invisible phone. <laughs> and now I want you to text this number. I'm going to give you five seconds to text this number with your invisible phone. You're not actually texting it. <laughs> Fake phone in front of you. And Andrea, go ahead and do this as well. So you're gonna have five seconds. This is worse. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> actually text the number, like what the numbers would be. Yeah, no, I was... Zero, one, four, seven, eight, five, two, Three six nine eight five two one four seven. You, it's a physical pattern that you can play on your phone. So rather than memorize the numbers, memorize the pattern. So I don't have to know the numbers; I just have to know the pattern, and then I can fill in the blanks with my thumb. So I wish I had a picture of a numpad on this to show you, but if you look at your phone. Uh, how your phone is set up. It's got like that, the three numbers and three columns uh, and then the zero at the bottom. Press the zero to start and then you okay. can go one, four, seven, eight, five, two, three, six, nine, eight, five, two, one, four, seven. And you're not remembering the numbers anymore, but your brain fills in the gaps. You remember the pattern and then you're able to remember the numbers by filling in the blanks on the pattern. And that is essentially a watered down version of thinking eidetically. More bananas. Our, our childhood, my childhood phone number um, was the the standard beginning. And then uh, our phone number was in a star. I, yep. I can't remember what the number is, but I know that it's, oh, it's two, four, eight, six. Yeah. But you remembered the pattern. This, That's thinking eidetically. I remember eidetically. the pattern. And so looking at this and saying, I want to memorize this as quickly as I can, this might seem a little daunting because it's got a lot of weird words that if you're not into like science or nursing or anatomy or something like that, you're, you don't approach these things in like the normal day-to-day -day life, maybe the frontal lobe, maybe spinal cord, but not the rest. So when we are going to memorize this, we're going to take it out of the page and we're going to put it in 3D space. We're going to have to use our imaginations for this. And so, Andrea, uh, you're going to need to follow along, and Heather's going to have to uh, Heather's going to have to try to keep you honest here, because you're going to have to kind of mime things. I don't know if your camera is on for Heather, but if it can be on, you should turn it on so Heather can uh, help you out with it. But this is what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be holding the brain in front of us. And so, Marissa, you're going to have to follow along too. You're going to hold the brain basically like this. You got a brain in your hands. Now, I want you to actually like try to believe you're holding a brain in your hands. Imagine how much it would weigh and what it would feel like. And now take one hand and place it in front of the brain and it's like under the uh, frontal lobe and just you're holding the weight there. It's now resting almost entirely on that hand. And I want you to take your right hand and then grab onto the spinal cord. Just hold on to it. So you're holding the brain kind of like this. So now, uh, Marissa, I'm going to pick on you because Carolyn's already seen this. Uh, so I'm going to pick on you again. I'm going to ask you to describe your brain. And it's very important to describe things as you're doing this when you're thinking identically. You don't just think in 3D space. You give it like 
uh, textures and smells, feels. Um, and so you're holding your brain and you're gripping onto the spinal cord. And Melissa, what does the spinal cord feel like? Um, rope. Feels like rope? Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it like scratchy? A slimy, it slimy, slimy nerve-laden. Um, I would imagine that it's, it is stiff but pliable. Stiff but pliable. So it's like a stiff but pliable, almost like a rope feeling. Um, or like a twist tie. Or like a twist tie. And keep in mind, this doesn't have to be correct. And in fact, being incorrect is almost always better. You want to use your brain's first instinct. Uh, and this is going to help your brain remember. Whatever is easiest, that's what you want to remember. So we've got our rope of a spinal cord. It's slimy and sticky and it's pliable, but stiff. And now we're going to move our hands up. And Marissa, I want you to squeeze the cerebellum. How tough is the cerebellum? Is it squishy? Is it like, like raw meat? Is it just like egg white? Like what, what does that feel like? Like a stress ball. Feels like a stress ball. So we've got our rope of a spinal cord and it's slimy and sticky and we're squeezing our stress ball of a cerebellum. It's got that just enough resistance where it kind of pushes you back when you stop squeezing. So we've got our rope sticky spinal cord and our stress ball of cerebellum and we're gonna slide our hands up the back and it's very important to do the physical motion. So Andrea, make sure you're following along even if it feels silly. I apologize if someone's watching you you have to explain you're <laughs> miming a brain. And we're gonna just palm the back of the brain and we're gonna be touching the occipital lobe. So just kind of move your hands along it and imagine what that would feel like. And this could be a dried brain or it could be a fresh brain. It could be oozing cerebrospinal fluid and blood, whatever, whatever is vivid in your mind. So you got your rope of a spinal cord, sticky and slimy and tough but pliable and you've got your stress ball of a cerebellum it's got a little bit of resistance to it and you've got this slimy occipital lobe it's just oozing stuff as you press into it so you're just barely moving over and then up top you have the parietal lobe so you have your rope sticky spinal cord stress ball cerebellum palming the occipital lobe and now we're going to move up and we're going to touch the parietal lobe and then we have the post central gyrus and then I want you to move your fingers kind of like this and feel that groove. There's a groove right after the parietal lobe and the post-central gyrus, there's that groove there. That groove is called the central sulcus. Try to feel it on both ends of your fingers. And then in front of the central sul sulcus, it's the pre-central gyrus. So we're going from the back to the front. So it's post-central gyrus, central sulcus, and then the pre-central uh, gyrus. From the front, it would be pre-central post, from the back to the front, it's post central pre because we're going backwards. So we have our rope of a spinal cord and then we have our, this is you, Marissa. What's next? I'm we sorry, our, you cut out for a rope. second. We have a oh, rope. Oh, the cerebellum? Yeah, we have our cerebellum and you always want to describe it however you can. Oh, remember. I'm it's sorry. The stress ball of a cerebellum. The stress ball of a cerebellum and then and now squishy. you're moving your hand up and you're going to palm the occipital lobe occipital lobe and then the next is going to be the parietal lobe parietal lobe and then you have three things there's this groove that you can move your uh, hands in what are these three things all together we're going to chunk these uh the post the central and the pre yeah and in between gyrus. them is the uh central sulcus central sulcus and andrea if you heard her she was like central sulcus because that's not a usual word so it's very important to actually say these things out loud that's why i asked her to describe what she's doing because if you passively just go mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you won't end up remembering it. you have to actively participate in memory and so we've got our rope of the spinal cord we've got our stress ball of the cerebellum we've got our occipital lobe parietal lobe and we have our post central uh pre-central gyrus and our central sulcus like this groove and now i want you to take your hand and just reach over the front of the brain and just palm the frontal lobe. This is where all the thoughts really come from. You're just going to palm it. And I want you to slide your hand underneath and just kind of do this and feel that groove underneath the frontal lobe. That is called the Sylvian fissure. That's a unique word. So go ahead and say Sylvian out loud because you probably haven't before. Sylvian. Sylvian. So we've got two weird words, sulcus and Sylvian. And gyrus is pretty weird too. 
Um, so we've got our sylvian fissure, and then there's a temporal lobe and a brainstem. Now we're going to go back again. We grab onto our rope of a spinal cord, and it's slimy and it's stiff, but it bends. And next we have the, and Marissa just guide us through this. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, stress ball feeling like cerebellum. Mm -hmm. We'll slide our hand up towards the occipital lobe. Further up next is the parietal lobe, the postcentral gyrus, and the precentral gyrus, but in the middle is the central sulcus groove. If we reach all around, there's the frontal lobe. And uh, to me, I imagine that it felt very warm and heavy. And if you kind of curve your hand underneath there, there's the sylvan, uh, sylvian fissure. And then next, the temporal lobe and the brainstem. Yeah. And so the sylvian fissure is right between the frontal lobe and then the temporal lobe. Uh, I always like to imagine that I'm reaching really far, just like unnaturally reaching over the brain like this to barely touch the temporal lobe. That's always helped me remember. And then the brainstem is at the end. And I found the brainstem easy to end on because everyone knows the brainstem. Uh, they've heard that before. Uh, and you're memorizing a brain, so it has the word brain in it. Brain is it? Brain in it. So it's pretty easy to remember. So now we're going to go through this again, except without the notes. <laughs> so take your hands and hold them forward like this, like you're holding the brain. And it's very important to have the physical process down. So this is how we started memorizing it, and this is how we want to bring it back. Now we take our left hand, and we want to move it underneath the brain, and we take our right hand and we grab onto the... Am I filling in here or are we gonna You're let, filling um, in. Okay. And try to describe it the same way you did previously. The spinal cord, which is yeah. slimy and pliable. Mm -hmm. Next we have the cerebellum. Yep, and it's yes. squishy like a stress ball, just enough squishy resistance. Squishy like a, the um, occipital lobe. Uh, yeah, and so you're palming the occipital lobe, and then next is the um, something cortex. <laughs> Not cortex. And if you are ever like, oh man, I don't remember what the next one was, then there's two strategies that you can use. And I deliberately didn't have you memorize this one properly. So sorry for tricking you, but all the other ones had sensations or feelings or repaired with something else. We just glossed over this one and one other one. Um, if you don't remember something, there's two strategies you can use. One is start back at the beginning. So we have the rope-like sticky spinal cord. Mm -hmm. We have the squishy stress ball cerebellum. And then we palm the occipital lobe. And then next is the... That is parietal normal, lobe. Parietal lobe. And see, Woo! your brain just filled in the gaps. You didn't think you knew it. And when you were actively thinking about it, you're like, I don't know but you immediately knew the parietal lobe when we just restarted the process because you're recalling that specific pattern. And you can just say brain, hold, spinal cord, cerebellum, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, and now you're back into it. So now start from the beginning, just hold your brain and then okay. go up through very quickly. And then what's after the parietal lobe? Um... And don't just try to remember, go through the process. It's very important to do the physical process, just like you remember the star on your phone you're remembering mm -hmm. the hand motions and your brain is filling in the gaps afterwards. Also, there's a screaming child in my background. So that's why I'm a little distracted. <laughs> so I might need some help hard from mode. my friends. Hard yes, mode. <laughs> everything with kids is on hard mode. So yeah. Carolyn, feel free to chime in. Um, <laughs> so I am holding the brain in my left hand and I'm holding the spinal cord in my right. And it is squishy and pliable like a twist tie. Next is the cerebellum and it is warm and firm like a stress ball. And sliding my hand up is the occipital lobe. And then the, uh, if you slide your hand further up is the, um, I can't remember, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so parietal you chunk lobe. these three together. Mm -hmm. Go through the parietal hand. Parietal lobe, we did the occipital lobe, the parietal, the parietal lobe. lobe, and then there's three things together. The central gyrus is in the middle. Close. There's three things together. Remember, we're going backwards instead of forwards. <laughs> so I'm so Carol, sorry. You can jump in here. She, I can <laughs> hear the kid in the background. The, the post-central gyrus. 
and then the central sulcus <laughs> and the precentral gyrus. Yeah. And now we're going to reach for it and we're going to grab onto the frontal lobe. And now we're reaching all the way over and we're feeling this oddly named gap, which is the Sylvian fissure. Yeah. And then this is the other one we glo glossed over, which is the That is the one we glossed over. Mhm. Mm and I gloss over these two uh, in particular because I like for people to realize, hey, this is a real deal. You actually can remember things and your brain can just pop them up if you remember them properly. But if you just gloss over it and say, yeah, I read it. While we were memorizing this, you probably didn't think of anything different from the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. They were just like the occipital lobe or the frontal lobe or the sylvian fissure. But when you actually went to recall it, you didn't remember. And it's because we didn't memorize those properly. And then the last one, uh, it has the word brain in it. So it's always somewhat easy to remember is the- Brainstem. Brainstem. Um, so I, uh, I just wanna point out that it's not enough just to read something. You have to actively use strategy to memorize it. So uh, real quick, anyone can jump in, Andrea as well. Who remembers the list of 10 items from before earlier in the presentation? <laughs> Does anyone remember? remember there was a car? There was a car. Why do you remember the car? I think it was, it was, it was first. It was first. It was the first in the list. There's a few others you might remember. 1,000 bees. 1,000 bees. Why would you remember 1,000 bees? <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> because it's like the banana. It, sta it stood out. Uh, and there were also several that rhymed. And you might not remember mm. what they are, but you remember there was like that same ain, ain, ain uh, sound. Uh, and so you had the ones at the beginning you remember, you remember like there's rhymes and you remember the things that really stand out. Uh, so there are things that you will remember just naturally. Uh, and if you can pick those out, you can use those as peg words. So knowing that car is the start and it's much easier to remember car, you can use car just like we use the brainstem. Uh, there's a banana again. So we're gonna do this uh, memory game except this time you're going to memorize it. And I apologize because this is the strongest ability like that you're going to learn. And if you memorize something in this fashion, it's almost impossible to forget it if you do it properly. And <laughs> I used to do this for high schools in person uh, a lot, especially during my student teaching. And I would have them challenge me and they would give me a list of 50 objects and I would memorize it. And unfortunately I have all of those lists still memorized and I can't forget them. So we are going to create kind of a Marvel movie. And Andrea, if you are there and can speak, I would like to use this for, uh, use you for this one if possible. I apologize for calling on you if you're unavailable. So Heather, is Andrea able to speak? If Heather's still there. Yes. Can you hear? Say something, Andrew. Hi. So, uh, Andrew, are you familiar with Marvel movies? Yes, I actually love Marvel. Good, because today you are going to be creating your own Marvel scene. We're going to use Iron Man and Ant-Man. So I want you to envision Iron Man and Ant-Man in your head, and you are going to be a director of a new film involving Iron Man and Ant-Man. And it's going to start with the car. So... I want you to imagine Iron Man and Ant-Man. Now I want you to imagine this car. What does this car look like? Black and red. What color is it? Black. Okay, so you've got a shiny black car. And now I want you to use your mind's eye like a camera. So kind of frame things and try to give it the same like movement like a movie in your head. So. Close your eyes if it helps. And you've got this shiny black car and I want the camera to like be looking in the window and you see Ant-Man and he's hiding like this in the car. And I want behind it, I want you to see just a giant Iron Man move down. His eyes are glowing and he's looking. And then Ant-Man turns over and then he sees Iron Man looking at him and he just says, oh crap. And he starts to run out of the car. So after he runs out of the car, He's going to do something with the boat, and you're going to decide what that is. So I want you to describe the scene to me. We've seen that Ant-Man has shrunk himself down, 
and he has been hiding in a toy black car, and now he's running towards a toy boat. What does that scene look like? Uh, maybe get the boat and then find, place the boat to find Ant-Man. Okay, so uh, Ant-Man runs, and he tries to hide behind the boat, and Iron Man's hand just like reaches over and moves the boat, and he sees Ant-Man. Is this accurate so far? All right, so one thing you always want to do when you're memorizing like this is you want to start back at the beginning. Just like we did with the brainstem, we want to do the same thing with this movie. So the scene opens, we got the shiny black car. Ant-Man is hiding in the car, he's hunkered down, and you see the Iron Man head just go zoom. You might hear that THX sound, it's like whoom. And then you see the shiny eyes, and Ant-Man's like, oh crap, I'm spotted. And then he runs out of the car, and he runs towards this other boat, and he hides behind it, and Iron Man's hand just slowly moves over and lifts up the boat. And he's giant, so it looks like <laughs> slow motion. And then Ant-Man is panicking, and then he runs towards a train. So now he runs into this train, and then as he's running from car to car in this train, you see the camera is like following him, and he, you see him like running through these windows. He's running down this toy train, and then in the background you see a cat. What color is this cat? Orange. So you have this nice orange cat. I was thinking of an orange cat too. Um, so you have this nice orange fluffy cat and its tail just flicks once, just kind of signaling danger. And you see the cat watching Ant-Man run through this train and then it jumps off and then it's just going to smack the train as hard as it can. It's trying to get Ant-Man and just smacks the train. And Ant-Man goes flying. He's in between train cars and he just goes flying out. So back at the beginning, we have the scene where there's a shiny black car and Ant-Man's hunkered down in it. You just see Iron Man giant head through the car window. His eyes are glowing. Ant-Man says, oh crap, he found me. He runs out of the car, hides behind the boat. Iron Man's hand just reaches over and he lifts up the boat. Ant-Man starts running again because Iron Man's after him and he runs into a train. He's running through the train cars. And then you see this nice orange cat. The cat flicks its tail once, and then it jumps down onto the table where this train is. This goes bop and hits it once. And then Ant-Man flies out of the car and lands in a moat. But it's not a real moat. He is on like a fake, like a train track, like a train set <laughs> with like the fake trees and like the green moss and things like that. That's where this is all taking place. So once he hits the moat, we have to bring in the word brain somehow. That's on this list. So what does Ant-Man say or do with the word brain? You could like say you get brain damage from all this running and your arms running around. <laughs> so I actually heard that in his voice. It's pretty funny. Uh, you should write for Marvel. Um, so we've got our scene with the shiny black car. Ant-Man's hunkering down. Iron Man goes, boom. You see the shiny eyes. And then Ant-Man's like, oh, crap, he found me. And he runs out of the car and he hides behind a boat. Iron Man lifts up the boat. But Ant-Man's already running through the train. And he's going from window to window to window. And you see the orange cat in the background flicks its tail once, leaps off, and then smacks the train. Ant-Man goes flying. And he lands on this fake blue felt moat. And he's like, boom. He starts running. And I, I could get brain damage from all this running and carousing around. And then... 1,000 bees. So we need to add that. So he, needs, he needs to say something or do something with 1,000 bees. So how do we add this in? And you can be creative. It doesn't have to make sense. He could say something about 1,000 bees or there could be actually 1,000 bees. Or it could just be like a board game box that says 1,000 bees, all pieces included. Like whatever you want, whatever's first uh, instinct. He could like I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you for a second. What did you say? He can like watch the news and like they can be talking about like 1,000 bees. Okay. So in the middle, like he's like, I could get brain damage from all of this running. And then he sees like on the TV, like this giant TV on the wall, there's like a news report about 1,000 bees. So you know, like this guy like in a suit and he's like, and recently the 1,000 bees project has reached its second stage. So we just have Ant-Man just like distracted by the TV while he's running. That would be a funny scene in a Marvel movie. Like he's in this tense chase thing and he's like, oh yeah, the 1,000 bees project. 
that's an interesting thing to add in. But Iron Man is after him, and he's like, oh, yeah, Iron Man. And so he's got his normal slapstick uh, humor uh, in this scene. And he runs to the edge of the table, and he turns back, and he sees Iron Man. He's, uh, Iron Man's getting like ready to rip up the table looking for him. And then Ant-Man looks over in the corner, and he sees a coat hanging on a hanger. What color is this coat? What kind of coat is it? And it's like a puffer jacket, like the North Face jacket coat. All right. So he's got a blue, puffy North Face jacket hanging on this coat rack. And it's giant because Ant-Man's tiny. Ant-Man's on the corner of the table, and he just leaps off of this table into the pocket of this coat. And you can see in the background that Iron Man sees him. And Iron Man runs over, and then he opens the pocket, but there's a hole at the bottom. And then through that hole, you see a drain. So we're going to go through this entire process again. So the scene starts and like the camera moves down and you see this black car. You don't know it's a toy yet. It looks like a real, real car. Ant-Man's cowered down hiding in it. And then you see this giant Iron Man head come down with the shining eyes. And that's when you realize, oh, Ant-Man shrunk himself down. And Ant-Man goes, oh, crap, he spotted me. And he exits the car and he runs to the boat. And then Iron Man's hand reaches over and removes the boat. And then Ant-Man's already running off and he goes into a toy train. And he's running from car to car to car to car to car. And then in the background, you see that orange cat and it flicks its tail once and it jumps off of its perch down onto this table and just smacks the train trying to get to Ant-Man. Ant-Man goes flying and then bam, bounces off of this fake blue felt moat on this like fake train set. And then he gets up and he starts running. He's like, I could get brain damage from all this running and carousing around. And then he gets distracted by the TV. There's a news reporter and he goes, the 1000 B project is now in its second stage. So I was like, oh yeah, the 1000 B project. That's neat. And then he was like, oh yeah, Iron Man. And he reaches the edge of the table and he turns around, sees Iron Man's like ripping up things in the table looking for Ant-Man. Ant-Man looks over and he sees that blue North Face puffy jacket hang on the coat rack. And Ant-Man just leaps off of the table directly into the pocket. In the background, you see that Iron Man sees him do this and he runs over and he opens up the pocket and there's a hole. And through that hole, you can see a drain on the floor. So now we're going to do that again, except you're going to walk us through this. So how does this scene start? So the camera's moving down and what do you see? Uh, a shiny fast car. Okay, what's inside this car? Or who's inside this car, I should say. Ant-Man. Ant-Man. And then behind him, you see what? You see Iron Man chasing him. Yeah. And then Ant-Man says, oh, crap, Iron Man. And he runs out of the car and hides behind A. Play the movie in your head. What does he hide behind? Train. Well, not train yet. Boat. Yeah. And whenever you're like, oh, I don't remember what the next one is, even if it feels silly, start back at the beginning and just play the movie at like fast speed in your head. Try to visualize it. And every time you remember it, it's actually going to get stronger. So uh, Iron Man reaches over and he moves the boat. And then Ant Man's already running off and he runs into the toy train set. Train. And now he's running from car to car to car. And in the background, we see a. an orange cat and it flicks its tail once and it jumps off and it smacks the train. He goes flying and he hits the blue felt oh. moat. And then he gets up, he's running off and he says, Get brain damage from all of this and creating. Yeah. And then he gets distracted by the TV as he's running. There's a news anchor and the news anchor says, there's going to be 1000 bees. And then Ant-Man's like, oh, that's nice. Oh, wait, Iron Man. He reaches the edge of the table, and then he looks up, and then he sees... Moon coat on the hanging on the coat rack. Yep. And then he looks back, and Iron Man is just tearing up the table looking for him. So Ant-Man goes for it. He jumps off of the corner, and he lands in the pocket. And then Iron Man sees him do this. So he runs over, and he opens up the coat pocket, and then through the hole, he sees... This is how Ant-Man escaped. This is the hardest one. So this one didn't quite go over, but it is a drain. And 
uh, this was just like what 30 seconds a minute I mean like really looking at it most of the time we were just talking about Marvel and like imagining our own scenes the actual words not very much time but because you created this scene in your head what you did is you created something called a memory palace and this allows you to build things up uh, in a way that you can mem remember them forever so as kind of like a personal project for you describe that scene to somebody else and just see if you remember which words were actually on the list. Um, and this is very fast. Like you can do this much more in depth uh, and actually spend time on it. And I also want to point out that just like the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, the two we had trouble with here were boat and drain. We didn't talk about the color of the boat. We didn't talk about the size of the boat. We didn't do anything special with the boat. He just hid behind the boat and then he was gone. We didn't talk about the drain. We just said, you saw a drain. So whenever we don't assign emotion, uh, assign feelings, experiences to objects, our brain says, not important, not important. We don't need it. And it tries to trim it. It's hard to remember. So that was a whole lot of memory stuff. That's the fun stuff. But once you learn how to memorize things, it was like, well, how do we actually effectively study? And uh, I don't remember what time we actually started this. I know we started a little bit late, but I will move through this quickly to save your time. Um, so studying and improving performance. If you forget everything we said earlier, except for, I guess, your own personal Marvel scene, uh, remember this, sleep at a consistent schedule. This is the most important thing you could ever do, not only for your health, but for your memory. You wanna sleep at a consistent schedule and sleep more if possible, but not too much. Um, it's better to get a consistent seven hours than an inconsistent nine hours. If you're falling asleep anywhere from like eight to two, but getting nine hours of sleep, you're gonna do way worse than someone going to bed at midnight and getting seven hours every day. Um, this is because your brain will actually adapt to when you fall asleep and it expects you to wake up at roughly the same time. So if you're always waking up groggy, but your time, the time you're going to sleep is not consistent, that's one of the reasons why. You're either not getting enough or you're not sleeping at a consistent schedule. Now, if you don't get enough sleep, your neurons actually slow down. You think slower. That strobe light slows down, like the batteries are running out. You essentially get dumber overnight just by not getting enough sleep. And it's really bad because you adapt poorly to changes. Uh, your attention span decreases. Your ability to like figure out complex tasks just disappears. You can't concentrate on anything. You get that brain fog. And you also lose the ability to emotionally regulate. And if you look at all of these things in that list, it's basically describing a toddler. You toddlerize yourself uh, without enough sleep. And you've probably noticed that people who don't get enough sleep aren't exactly performing at their best and they might be a little cranky. And this is why uh, your brain does not like that. It needs the sleep. And one of the reasons that your brain needs sleep is something called adenosine. So adenosine is a byproduct of your neurons firing. And when your neurons are doing their thing, they create this adenosine as a byproduct, basically, and it's floating around your brain. And this is acting as a waste product. Now, if it's acting as a waste product in your brain, uh, your brain needs to get rid of it. It only gets rid of it when you're sleeping. And it only gets rid of it at certain times in your sleep. So you don't sleep enough. This waste product is still there. And your brain is just going to be like, oh, I'm polluted. And some people drink caffeine to try to offset that feeling of sleepiness. Um, Caffeine works because it's shaped uh, in a similar fashion to adenosine. So if you look at that chemical structure, it looks very similar to adenosine. And how adenosine works is your brain has these adenosine receptors uh, all over and the adenosine fits in those receptors almost like a jigsaw puzzle piece. Well, caffeine is like the same jigsaw puzzle piece. So it fits into the receptors instead of the adenosine. And because adenosine in that receptor makes you sleepy, but caffeine doesn't, you don't feel sleepy anymore. Uh, so this can be good for like short-term studying. You're like, oh, I'm feeling sleepy, but I need to study or I need to do something. Uh, caffeine can be great for that. Unfortunately, the adenosine is still there. And so this is what happens when you have a caffeine crash. You drink a bunch of caffeine, and then after the caffeine releases itself uh, over time from those adenosine receptors, the adenosine is still there and it hits all at once and you just fall apart. So caffeine has severe limitations. It's often better just to get more sleep uh, if you're feeling groggy all the time or just taking a nap. Uh, don't rely too much on caffeine and recognize that there's no free lunch here. Uh, you drink the caffeine, you get a crash later. 
Um, an important thing about studying and performing, improving performance is you will lie to yourself uh, and you don't want to do that. You think you'll know the material, but you don't. Just like how no one raised their hand and said, excuse me, we didn't properly go over the boat or the drain. We didn't go over the temporal lobe or the parietal lobe. Everyone just assumed they knew it. And then when it came to fill in the blank time, everyone's like, well, I am not going to participate because I don't actually know it. Uh, and it's because you thought you knew the material. Um, and our brains work this way uh, naturally. Everyone's does. Your teacher's does. Mine does. Carolyn's does. Marissa's does. Everyone does this forever. It, it never stops. You have to actively stop it. And to do that, you need to find objective ways to evaluate your performance. So one of the best ways is flashcards and keeping score. And I know some people don't like to keep score because you can feel bad if you're on the losing end, but it is one of the best ways. Uh, like find a friend that you are comfortable with and then do flashcards and be openly honest about how many you're missing. Like how many times have you done flashcards and you look at it and it's on the tip of your tongue. Like, I know this. Uh, yeah, I knew that one. And you, you flip the card over, you're like, oh yeah, I knew it. And then you just, it goes back to the pile, but you don't actually know it, uh, but you felt that you knew it just like you felt you knew the temporal lobe and parietal lobe. And you're like, ah, I can't do it when you're asked. And then I tell you what it is. You're like, oh yeah, I knew that. I knew the drain. I knew the boat, um, but you really didn't. Um, so flashcards are great at that if you have a friend and you're keeping score. So you can't look back and say, yeah, I knew most of those. When if you had kept like a yes and no pile, it would have been like 50-50. You want to keep score. Online quizzes are great. Uh, if you're using Google Classroom, your instructor can create quizzes for you. And if you ask them, you're like, hey, I want a study quiz. Could you create a study quiz with infinite attempts for me? your teacher will probably be overjoyed. Uh, they would love that you are so active that you're wanting to study by regularly quizzing yourself. Um, teach others without using notes. Uh, so like if you wanted, if, if you thought, man, this presentation is giving me stuff that will be great if I can remember it forever, teach it to other people. Pick out the pieces that you think are the most important and then teach it to someone else. And it'll help you know whether you know it or not. Because if I asked someone to give this presentation the moment we were done, they probably wouldn't be very comfortable doing it. And it would be an objective way of knowing uh, whether they actually knew the content or not. Um, this is one of those I spy pictures. And I like to use these or real world surroundings to kind of uh, wake myself up. And uh, it's like a way to stretch your brain. So just kind of to yourself, look at this picture and move your eyes from object to object and say the color in your head as quickly as you can. It's more important to be fast than it is to be accurate. So it's just like purple, blue, black, blue, red, white, yellow, blue, blue, white, yellow, blue, pink, green, pink, blue, yellow. And you wanna go as fast as you can and even try to trip yourself up. And you'll notice that as you're doing this, your brain wakes up. Uh, this is actually something that uh, some driver's ed people will tell drivers to do if they start feeling sleepy behind the wheel because it gets the brain flowing because your brain doesn't know you're doing nonsense. It thinks you have this really complex computational problem and everything's flying at you because you're manually telling your brain that everything's important. It's not, but it primes your brain and wakes you up. Uh, and find what works for you. Um, like if you're doing flashcards and you're able to objectively um, if you're able to objectively assess your performance, but you're not improving by using flashcards, find a different way uh, to study, like f do something else. So that's part of why objective is important is so you can do that. You say, this isn't working. I need to do something else. And you're going to be responsible for this for your entire life because your teacher might have a certain way of teaching and they might not be able to teach in a way that is useful for you and the entire class. So you have to kind of put in the work to figure out, does this actually work for you? You don't wanna find out on test day whether you know it or not. Um, a few highlights, uh, teachers hate it when I say this, but books are awful. Uh, they're great for storing information, but they're not great for learning. Excellent for like just fun reading, excellent for getting a broad view, but for remembering things permanently, not great. Uh, you want to take the information from the books and I don't mean highlight, I mean actually taking proper notes from the book and then put it in a way that allows you to remember. So if we wanted to remember the lungs, we would probably just put like a single word, like remember lungs and then one word next to it. What do you think that word would be if we want to remember all of the lungs? That's a question for you, Andrea. What's at the top? 
What do we start with? The trachea. The trachea. Yeah. And so once you have the trachea, you remember, oh yeah, superior lobe, inferior lobe, middle lobe, and then primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, and then the cardiac notch, like SML, SCI, so many infections. And then like you filled in most of the blanks already just from that one word. Uh, and we can do the same thing with the brain. We're like, oh, the spinal cord and the, the list with the car. we like, car. And then we're like, oh yeah, the boat, train. And then you can go through the rest of the list. Um, bullet points are very good for notes. Lists are very good. Paragraphs are bad. Whole sentences are bad. What you want to do with notes is use them as a tool to study, not to read, but to study. So if you want, need to memorize the lungs, you have that lung diagram someplace else. It's in your book. It's wherever. You don't need to write it down. You instead write, remember lungs, trachea. And then when you're studying with a friend, you would say, all right, uh, trachea, superior lobe, uh, main, primary bronchus, uh, secondary bronchus. What did that secondary one start? SML. Oh yeah, low bar. Um, and then you can just like mentally go through it. And by doing that, you're remembering it. Uh, and that repeated recall in the same way makes that memory stronger. Uh, you also want to be very deliberate. This is again, figure out what you're studying and tell yourself how long you're studying. If you say, I'm going to go study for an indeterminate amount of time, you're going to sit down for about seven minutes and then you're going to open up Facebook or TikTok or like whatever social media you use. And that's just how studying goes. Uh, but if you say, I'm studying for 20 minutes and I'm studying this topic, then you can sit down, you grind it out. And if you look at the clock, you're like, I've got seven minutes left and it's fine. Um, you want to test yourself regularly and repeatedly. Set a schedule if you can. Remove any distractions and I know people all the time, they say, I learn better with like conversation. I learn better with music in the background. No, you don't. I promise you're, it takes up memory in your brain. Um, when you're creating notes for your class, try to put it all in one page. So rather than having like four pages of notes, like all double spaced and written, ni uh, written nicely, uh, make it chaotic if you need to. Use single pe peg words, like just say trachea brainstem, like just whatever minimum you can have on a note page and see if you can remember from that. Uh, and lastly, um, there's one tool that you can use as spaced repetition. So when you forget something, uh, it's generally not a knowledge issue, it's an accessibility issue. It means the highways have broken down. So you need to train your brain to keep maintaining those highways. And so there are like apps for spaced repetition you can use and they generally do things like this. So they say, oh, you're gonna have a test in three weeks. So you do the first repetition, then one day later you do the next, then three days later you do the next, then four days, then seven days, then five days, and then your test. And that's great, it's optimal, but it's a little clunky to remember. And I found that most people don't follow through. Here's what I do instead. Um, when you're doing like flashcards or notes, just make four piles every day, every other day, end of week, end of every other week. Have everything in the everyday pile. And like, if you're using flashcards, if you know it, it goes in the every other day pile. If you don't, it goes in the everyday pile and you get back to it the next day. And you just keep doing that forever. Whenever you forget something, you move it back one level. So if it was in end of week and you forgot it, you move it to the every other day. If you remember, you move it to the next one until eventually everything is slid over to the end of every other week. Uh, and then, like every two weeks, you're just doing a brief refresher with these flashcards. So really quickly, how many bananas were there total in this presentation? Does anybody actually know? I do. How many? Seven. You wanna put money on it? Yes. <laughs> there we go, very quickly through this. Four. Oh no, the, we did the double, the, we re-showed the four. Eight. Does that count? Yeah, it counts. So 12. There's 11 a three. Bananas. There's 11. And there's another four we skipped over. So 15 total. So I lose, okay. You lose. I, hopefully I did not diminish the <laughs> point of your presentation. No, it's not. Uh, I, <laughs> I bring this up to tell people like, don't assume you know things because everyone always assumes that they know the bananas because they're feeling confident. Uh, 
and they don't. So uh, I think this is about all we had for the allotted time. Uh, I generally just try to go over the last thing, but uh, this is about all the time we have. I don't want to steal your time, but uh, thank you for showing up. And I hope this is actually helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can give them to me. Yeah, Andrea, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Not, that, not any I can think of, really. So out of curiosity, Andrea, was anything in this presentation, did it seem useful to you or stand out in any way? It was very useful to me. Well, since you were the only one who showed up here, if you actively try this and you actually try to remember it, like hold your invisible brain in your hand and try to go through it, uh, try to remember the lung, just like write it down, like in a circle, even if you don't have a lung diagram, try to explain your Marvel scene to somebody else and to see how it works for you. Like, don't just take my word for it. Um, so like part of that smell test, the evidence part, well, the evidence for this is, did you remember? And like, I was able to showcase like why some things worked and why some things didn't by like skipping over parietal lobe and temporal lobe. But you can test these things for yourself with other people, not only to see if you know it, but if it works and you can figure out what works for you personally. So I definitely suggest you try to do that. Um, so there's your Marvel scene. But that is, that is it for the presentation.